Okay, perfect. Yeah, I should go full screen, I guess. Uh, into full screen. Okay, so good afternoon, uh, everyone. So the title of my uh, presentation is Inclusive and Diffractive Digest Photo Production in Ultra Peripheral Heavy Ion Collisions at the Large Hadron Collider. I'm going to report on uh, several results which were obtained in collaboration with uh, Michael Klassen and uh, which were published in these papers. So this is uh, my outline. Uh, I will first briefly present ultra peripheral collisions. I guess there is no need to go into any length because uh, the subject was discussed in a number of talks at this, at this workshop already, both in plenary and in parallel session talks, especially in the small x uh, parallel session, both from experimental and theoretical perspective. And in the main part of my talk, I will discuss uh, um, our predictions for inclusive digest photo production in lead-lead ultra-peripheral collisions at the LHC and what this process tells us about nuclear part and distribution functions for heavy nuclei at small x. And uh, in, the, in the last third of my talk, I will discuss our results for diffractive digest photo production and lead-lead ultra-peripheral collisions at the LHC and will explain that this process probes uh, novel diffractive nuclear part distribution functions and may also shed some light on the uh, QCD factorization breaking for this process. So I'm going to start by uh, saying a few words about ultra peripheral collisions. Uh, so ultra peripheral collisions, UPCs for short, is the situation when uh, ions in beams interact at large impact parameters, which are much larger than the sum of the uh, nucleus radii. In this case, the strong hydrogen interactions are suppressed and the interaction proceeds via emission of quasi-real uh, photons in a well-known by Zecker Williams equivalent photon approximation. Therefore, uh, UPCs in the LHC kinematics allow one to study photon-photon and photon-hydrogen uh, interaction at uh, unprecedentedly uh, high energies and therefore present an energy frontier uh, for this field of research. Uh, as such, uh, UPCs can be used to study open questions of proton and nuclear structure in QCD, and also can be used to search for new physics. In my talk, I will, uh, I will focus on, um, on nuclear structure in uh, quantum chromodynamics. Uh, uh, you probably heard a number of talks on UPCs at this workshop already. And uh, one could infer that the focus of UPC measurements at the LHC so far has been uh, exclusive, that is coherent photo production of heavy, that is charmonia and light vector mesons uh, on protons in nuclei. And the main interest in studying these processes is to constrain uh, poorly known gluon density at small x. In proton, one can go down to six and 10 to the minus six. In heavy nuclei, uh, UPCs at the LHC allow one to uh, probe a nuclear gluon density down to six and 10 to the minus four. Uh, in my talk, I'm going to discuss a complementary probe of nuclear party distribution functions, namely uh, uh, diejet photo production in ultra peripheral collisions. Uh, main uh, contributions to inclusive digest photo production are presented here. So the left plot shows the direct photon contribution when the photon enters the hard scattering as a, as a photon as a whole. And the plot on the right shows one of uh, uh, typical leading order diagrams uh, giving a uh, contribution to the result photon term. This is the situation when the photon uh, takes part in the hard scattering via its uh, protonic, that is quark and uh, gluon or gluon structure. Um, so these diagrams correspond to the case of inclusive digest photo production and allow us to get additional constraints on um, poorly constrained uh, nuclear part distribution functions and also on photon part and distribution functions. Requiring that the uh, nuclear target remains intact let me just move this bar here, Rem uh, remains intact. One can study diffractive digest photo production in lead-lead ultra-peripheral collisions. This process uh, gives, gives an access to novel 
nuclear diffractive particle distribution functions that have never been studied before, and also may shed some light on, on the mechanism of QCD factorization break breaking for uh, digest photo production. So let me uh, first uh, discuss our results for inclusive digest photo production. So uh, we use the framework of collinear factorization and, and next to leading order perturbative QCD, which has been successfully tested in, um, in electron proton scattering at HERA. And uh, the results are summarized in these papers uh, led by Klassen and Kramer. Again, I show you two uh, typical contributions to the direct and photon contributions to the cross-section of this process, where I also indicate the momentum fractions. Y is the momentum fraction carried by the photon. Xa is, as usual, the parton momentum fraction on the nuclear side. And X gamma is the parton momentum fraction in the case of the result function contribution. In the collinear factorization, the cross-section of this process is presented as convolution with respect to the all-involved momentum fractions of the following quantities. So here we have the photon flux, uh, which is known very well from quantum chromodynamics. In, um, for large nuclei, for large ultra-relativistic nuclei, the intensity of the flux scales as the nucleus charge squared, and the uh, highest photon energy scales as the Lorentz factor of the emitting nucleus. And the simplified and typically used expression for the photon flux is given here. Then under the convolution integral, we have the photon PDFs for the resolved photon case, which is known mostly from the electron positron annihilation data. Then we have the lower part that the nuclear PDFs. In our analysis, we take two typical examples of NLO nuclear PDFs provided by the NCTEC and EPPS16 groups. And finally, all these on, uh, all this non-perturbative input is convoluted with the uh, hard uh, part in cross-section, which is calculated order by order in perturbative QCD, and which is, which, which is known. So using this formalism, we go ahead and make predictions uh, in the kinematics of the Atlas measurement. I have so, and two typical examples of, our, of this comparison are presented here, so the left, plot shows the uh, differential cross-section of digest photoproduction at 5 TeV in uh, lead-lead ultra-peripheral collisions. The calculations are done with the NCTEC 15 nuclear PDFs. The crosses show the, the, crosses show the pre preliminary atlas data and the curves uh, are our NLO calculations. So the left plot shows the dependence on the Digest transverse momentum. The right plot shows the uh, dependence on the nuclear momentum fraction Xa, which is reconstructed uh, from the digest measurement. Uh, one can see in these plots that we reproduce fairly well, although it's a log log scale, of course, uh, shape and normalization of the Atlas data. However, one has to note that the data is still preliminary despite that it's uh, two or three years old and has not been corrected for detector response. So in this plot, I uh, look in, uh, in the, in, in, to some extent into details of our predictions. So the plot on the, this plot shows the play between the result and direct photon contributions, uh, full result, uh, direct photon contribution, resolved photon contribution, and this is the uh, digest cross-section integrated over all variables, including the uh, transverse momentum, and is presented as a function of the momentum fraction Xa on the nuclear side. So from this plot, one can see that result photon dominate for large Xa. However, at uh, lower Xa, uh, result and direct uh, terms are compatible in size. And this is the trend which is, uh, has also been observed, uh, for instance, in uh, leading order analysis within the framework of uh, PTA-8. Next, uh, since we have our predictions, uh, we would like to uh, assess the magnitude of nuclear modifications uh, that are part of the calculation. To do so, we, uh, we plot the ratio of the full result to the calculation of this cross-section 
uh, done in the impulse approximation. In the impulse approximation, we turn off all nuclear effects and assume that uh, nuclear PDFs are some of the proton and neutron PDFs consisting the nucleus. And when we uh, plot the ratio, uh, the ratio R defined as such, uh, uh, we see that as a function of the momentum fraction Xa, the ratio R uh, repeats the trend of the ratio of the gluon density in the nucleus to that of the proton. That is, for low x, uh, we see some uh, suppression of the ratio, which is called nuclear shadowing. And we see that this is a 10% effect in the, in, this, in the atlas kinematics. Around 0.1, we have some enhancement, which is uh, around about 20% uh, anti-shadowing. And further down, at large x, we have, we have some insignificant suppression, which is uh, which is called the EMC effect in the, in the literature. Uh, so uh, now that we have our calculations, so what can we learn about nuclear PDFs from the comparison of our predictions to the, to the data? Uh, the typical way to assess the, uh, the importance of a particular measurement uh, to uh, proton or nuclear PDFs is to do statistical uh, reweighting, Bayesian reweighting, a Bayesian reweighting. So, and we repeated this exercise, which is commonly done in the literature. Uh, the procedures outlined here. So, uh, using uh, error nuclear PDFs, that is NCTEC 15 or EPPS 16, uh, we generated uh, 10,000 replicas uh, using the standard prescription with uh, random numbers. Then, for each replica, we calculate the digest for the production cross section. And the essence of the reweighting method is to find or to assign a statistical weight to every replica, which would quantify how well this particular replica uh, reproduces the data. Uh, instead of the actual data, which is still preliminary, we use uh, pseudo-data, which we calculate ourselves using the central value of nuclear PDFs. Vadim, I'm sorry, three minutes left. Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, we calculate the uh, chi-square for each replica, and then we assign a statistical weight to each, ref uh, to, to each replica. Then having these uh, this weights, we can calculate uh, reweighted cross-section and its, uh, its error. And the same can be done for nuclear PDFs. So this formula present uh, what have present the quantify the effect of pseudo data of the digest pseudo data on nuclear PDFs and results are presented here. The outer error band shows the existing uh, NCTEC 15 uh, uncertainties on the gluon densities at small x, and the reweighting of the digest data uh, gives the inner inner error band. Uh, which so this 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 exercise this analysis shows that if we assume a five percent error on the pseudo data on the jet for the production, this leads to a reduction of uncertainty by a factor of two at x uh, ten to the minus three for a nuclear gluon density in heavy nuclei. Then uh, we did a similar analysis for diffractive di for diffractive digest for the production. Uh, we use the same collinear. Uh, we, we use the same collinear formalism. The only difference is that instead of the uh, inclusive uh, part and distributions, we use diffractive part and distribution functions. Uh, these are novel quantities which are conditional probabilities. There are no global extraction for these quantities. Uh, these uh, nuclear diffractive PDFs are subject to nuclear um, to nuclear modifications. The at, at high energies, the main effect is the leading to its nuclear shadowing, which predicts a very strong nuclear suppression of this quantity. And uh, this, this uh, nuclear shadowing uh, suppresses uh, nuclear diffractive PDFs by a factor of six, that is, gives a factor of point, point 0.15 compared to the impulse approximation. So use our NLO PQCD framework, we made predictions, and they're presented here as, uh, as uh, here we present various distributions. Um, these are results cannot be compared to the data because there is no data. This is just uh, for the future for to stimulate uh, future measurements. Uh, then um, the last point I would like to raise that analysis of diffractive uh, digest for the production in uh, electron proton scattering at HERO show that QCD factorization is broken. That is, and the low calculations overestimate the data by a factor of two. However, the pattern is unknown. Uh, the same data can be described either by a global suppression factor of 0 
or one can uh, suppress only the resolved floating contribution by a factor of 0.34. Uh, in our analysis, we show that by studying the X gamma distribution of diffractive diejet uh, photoproducts and ultra peripheral collisions, one can actually differentiate between these two scenarios. And this is presented here in this plot. Uh, so let me, let me summarize. Uh, nuclear PDFs are poorly constrained by available fixed target and uh, proton nucleus um, LHC data. Therefore, there is a growing interest in obtaining new constraints on them using photon nucleus scattering in heavy ion ultra peripheral collisions at the LHC. Uh, inclusive digest photoproduction probes nuclear PDFs down to 5 times 10 to the minus 3. And I showed that it can reduce the current small x uncertainties in the gluon distribution by a factor of 2. Diffractive digest for the production, on the other hand, accesses novel nuclear diffractive PDFs and may uh, shed some new light on mechanism of QCD factorization in this process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Congratulations. You got a very precise description of the Atlas data. So uh, let's check. Somebody has the same question or comments. I see nothing. So I, I have a small question. Could you um, please go back to the slide number 11? Mm -hmm. There is the uh, predictions for the future, yes? Uh, this is, yeah, for diffractive digest photo production in uh, lead light UPCs at, uh, in run two, yeah. But uh, why we see the uh, three lines for each point? Uh, uh, the, the central one is the is the central prediction, and uh, the uh, the, uh, the dotted lines uh, quantify the um, the scale uncertainty, as usually done in these analog calculations. You vary the hard scale of the process. Usually, the hard scale is identified with the uh, transverse momentum of the leading jet. But to uh, uh, assess the scale uncertainty, that is the uh, NLO effects, one takes. Uh, uh, one takes twice the hard scale or 0.5 the hard scale. And this, uh, they, they show the scale uncertainty and this is uh, quantified by these dotted lines here. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so if uh, we have no more question, please uh, go to the thank next you. speaker. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker, so uh, we, Stay still with the ultra peripheral collisions, but now we move to the proton uh, lead collisions. Javier, uh, could you uh, share your slide? Okay, full screen. Thank you very much. Please start. You have Hello. 15 minutes. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so, um, so this is Javier here in Sonora, so I will give an update. On, uh, so this is uh, two particle correlations in gamma proton interactions. Uh, so this is within the context of uh, ultra peripheral collisions uh, in proton lead collisions at 8.16 TeV with this CMS experiment. Uh, so this is the outline of the talk. Uh, so we we'll start with a brief introduction and then I talk about the crucial CMS sub subsystems that we use for the analysis. Uh, I will mention a Monte Carlo reference that we are uh, currently adding into the final paper. Uh, and I will close with the correlation distributions that we produce and the results. Uh, so in a slide three here, uh, so there has been a history of studies for long range near side uh, 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 rich structure in large systems such as uh, gold gold or lead lead uh, in the in RIC or the LHC. And also we have uh, studies on a smaller systems such as deuterium gold in where you um, don't clearly see the rich structure. In, so this is the near side because it's uh, delta phi in zero, long range because it goes away uh, for large values of delta pseudo rapidity, as you can see here in these uh, circles. But in the large systems, you can see the clearer the, the, the effect. And in, in this smaller system, you don't see the reach, but you see a significant measured uh, coefficients 
that could be or not related with the uh, sort of quark gluon plasma effect. Um, so in this case, if uh, these are other results from the LAC with proton, proton, proton lead in where this effect is seen. Uh, um, and then uh, especially for the case of uh, higher track multiplicity events. So in this case uh, for proton, proton and lead, lead, this is the same uh, threshold for uh, track multiplicity. Uh, and we precisely measure these coefficients by projecting this uh, to the correlation distribution into the long, long range that goes over delta eta uh, two. So it takes uh, it averages all this region, and it adds up the, also the this uh, the, the the contribution from the opposite side. Uh, so th there is a, a set of techniques in where you can measure the correlations as well using multi-particle correlations. So rather than only taking two particles, you can take groups of four, six, or eight particles using uh, a different technique that is called cumulant uh, technique. Um, so in this case, there, there are studies in where uh, 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 it is sort of modeled the, why the difference, uh, uh, there is a difference between the, the technique I mentioned it, uh, based on the 2D uh, projection um, and the cumulant method. Uh, so this is uh, arising from a fluctuation effect, as it seems. Uh, as you can see, these B21 isotropies from multiparticle technique are in agreement with each other for proton lead in the left and lead lead in the right. But this uh, B2 uh, technique that we use in this analysis, which is consistent with these uh, red circles, differs from the ones from multiparticle uh, correlations, but this is sort of um, understood. Uh, this effect can be checked in this reference. Uh, so going into smaller systems, uh, so these are recent attempts to, uh, so there is the motivation of studying the correlations in even smaller systems, such as electron-proton, electron-electron uh, in Alep, or the recent publication from uh, Atlas and uh, Gamma Lep. Uh, so uh, the first thing to see is this sort of uh, the reach of the track multiplicity that you can get uh, from each of these systems as is, it is uh, much uh, smaller than with respect what you see for with proton proton and proton lead uh, minimum bias events. So um, so in this case the atlas gamma lead result uh, shows up a larger end track. Uh, than electron proton or electron electron. Um, Atlas shows a significant B2 anisotropy measurement. And this uh, electron proton and electron electron show uh, upper limits for the value of the same anisotropy. Uh, but there's no clear evidence of a rich effect in, in either of these analyses. Um, so for the case of CMS and search for gamma proton, so we use uh, the forward uh, calorimeter um, to ask for activity in the proton side, side, which is where the activity is going. And in the opposite side, we ask uh, for a lead that is um, not broken. Um, and then for this, we use the zero degree calorimeter. Uh, which means no, uh, this has to be consistent with no neutrons in this side. And then um, we in general use the calorimeters and the tracker to build a uh, forward rapidity gap, which is formed in this uh, sort of events. Um, for this, we use the particle flow algorithm from uh, CMS and the tracker uh, to um, apply quality cuts over the tracks that we use for the analysis. So in a slide eight here, uh, so this is uh, basically explaining. Uh, so for uh, these events, uh, we ask for a large uh, input uh, parameter that has to be at least uh, the, the over the ratios of the lead nuclei uh, 
uh, well, the addition of the two nuclei, but in this case, we have a proton. Um, and there is the formation of huge rapidity gap in the side in this side. And um, as I will mention, uh, these uh, photon flux can be modeled with this uh, equivalent photon approximation, which could lead to a photon that may reach energies of this uh, level of uh, 80 GeV. This has been studied before in a paper from CMS uh, on light by light scattering that uses the same uh, model for the photon flux. And this suppresses the hadronic interactions that occur in uh, results that have been previously studied with minimum bias um, uh, framework uh, that is represented with this uh, diagram here in the right with the smaller um, impact parameter. Uh, so this work, uh, so this is the pass that we have in CMS. Uh, this has been shown in previous conferences as well. Uh, but it's, um, so we are updating uh, with the comparison with Monte Carlo prediction. Uh, so this is the selection, so we can ensure a 95% gamma proton purity in our data sample. And this is confirmed uh, as the Monte Carlo shows a consistency in the track multiplicity range that we get with our data. So this is the same information that I that I just uh, mentioned it. So we require the proton going direction to be quiet, which is this side. Uh, the lead nucleus uh, is not breaking. Uh, and the, the activity goes into one side. And uh, we ask for the hadronic forward calorimeter to have at least one tower with an energy of 10 GeV. And we ask for a huge uh, rapidity gap uh, that ensures that there's no activity in the let go inside. Plus a lot of requirements over the tracks. Uh, it's like 10, uh, so here uh, I'll talk a little bit about the Monte Carlo reference. So this is uh, this was provided by the Pythia authors recently, I think from um, November uh, last year. And we started comparing our results with this uh, Monte Carlo. So the first uh, uh, thing, uh, so this is using the same strategy as what well, as is, as is uh, mentioned in the previous talk on the electron photon approximation and the uses of these uh, Bessel functions. Um, so this generates this low virtuality gamma proton uh, uh, in uh, proton LED. Uh, so one can decide the, what's the size of the Z number that corresponds to the lead nucleus. Um, and uh, so in this case, you can see that in our data, we saw a track multiplicity that goes up to 35. And that's what the Monte Carlo shows. In contrast with the minimum bias that, as you know, can go over 300 uh, in value. And uh, so uh, this is... Uh, this is um, uh, a very striking difference with respect to the minimum bias. And that limits our analysis because we are constrained to do the measurements within this region. And uh, this is the highest we can get uh, in terms of N-track. This is similar to the structure that is seen in uh, CUs with the electron uh, proton system. Um, so for this analysis, we build a signal uh, this, uh, to, pair, to the correlation distribution that takes the uh, angular differences in azimuthal angle and uh, pseudo rapidity. Uh, but uh, this, uh, this uh, correlation distribution takes tracks in the same event. And uh, the one in the right, uh, it's a, the background distribution that takes one track in an event and mixes it with tracks from uh, 100 random events. And that generates this uh, a structure that has this flat uh, 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 shape uh, along the azimuthal range. And it has, so the one that has same event pairs has this jet correlation peak at zero, zero. Uh, so if you take the ratio of those two, uh, following a standard procedure that has been used in previous publications, uh, so we get this ratio distribution. And this is here uh, where we put attention whether there is a, a, a rich uh, structure form. Uh, in our case, we are limited in terms of uh, the, the 
the, the reach of the delta, um, the delta eta uh, range for the gamma p enhanced data. So uh, in order to see it better, we have to project into a long range 1D distribution like here. Um, I'm sorry, three minutes left. left. Yes, okay. So in here, uh, so we can see that neither for the gamma proton, uh, there is no rich effect and the minimum bias at comparable multiplicity also does not show a uh, rich effect. But you can try to see the size of the measured uh, coefficients. So in this case, for the gamma proton, we see also similarly uh, Atlas, a significant uh, B2 and a significant B1. Uh, for, this is the low PT uh, category, and this is going to higher PT for the selected tracks. So you see the magnitudes of the B2 and the B1 increases with the PT. Uh, here I added separately uh, in the paper is together, but uh, but this is not uh, in the past. So uh, so I show the Monte Carlo that actually rep replicates this sort of behavior that we see with the data. So with the data we couldn't get this bin due to a statistics uh, limitation, but you can see that these two points uh, here are consistent with the behavior that you have with the data. And also here, the behavior, uh, what we have now in the paper is that B2 and B3 are consistent with these ones. This B1 um, uh, from the Monte Carlo has a bit smaller magnitude than the data, but as uh, shown up in the paper is uh, uh, within the, the limits, the error limits, the systematic error limits. So it still is uh, consistent uh, with the data. So in here, this is the V2 anisotropy. Uh, so this is the final um, figure in the paper. So in, in here, we compare the UPC enhanced with the minimum bias result. So you can see that the first highlight, the gamma proton is showing significant V2. And also it tends to be larger than what is shown for, for, with the minimum bias. The minimum bias, these points at lower PT have, shown in, have been shown in other publication in PRL and these points are new with higher PT. And here, um, uh, in the same way, adding the Monte Carlo, which is consistent with these uh, points uh, for corresponding with the UPC enhanced data, uh, sort of with a different trend, because this looks that uh, the, the, the values are increasing with track multiplicity, and this shows up a flatter behavior, but it's um, the uncertainties uh, so the, the points are consistent with the data gamma proton enhancement. So uh, to close, uh, so the study of two particle correlations uh, that uh, are related to initial geometry of the colliding system uh, can provide insi insights into transport properties. Uh, there is, uh, I had draw dynamic picture uh, so these uh, coefficients might be related with the hydrodynamic evolution of an expanding plasma, or it could be related with initial state uh, gluon correlations. Uh, so it's not a finalized discussion. Uh, so in here we measure uh, what we can extract from the limited uh, uh, statistics and acceptance we have, but uh, we measure significant values. Uh, uh, we see a very limited track multiplicity up to 35 that is consistent with the Monte Carlo. We measure B1 that is negative, B2 is positive, and B3 is consistent with zero. There's no evidence of rich like correlation, correlations, and there is a MC recent reference that it's been, been added to the paper. Uh, so the results provide insights to the origin of uh, rich like structures in uh, small systems. So this is all. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So now is the time for comments, question. Somebody would like to ask. I don't see the uh, license. Uh, so uh, thank you for uh, showing those figures with which we can imagine the effect of the collisions. I like this type of the uh, diagrams, but could you uh, back to the previous slide? Yeah. I, I would like to be sure. I understand that all uh, lines are from Pitya, yes? No. 
No, uh, the ones at the top are from CMS. So this is the UPC, uh, the gamma proton uh, data sample from CMS, the red one. Mm -hmm. The blue one is minimum bias that has been shown in previous papers. And this is uh, Monte Carlo, the one at the bottom. Okay, but the uh, the lower figure shows the Monte Carlo, okay, but points are from the experiment. The, mon uh, the bottom picture is not experiment. This is only Monte Carlo. Ah, okay. And this is being separated because uh, we are updating the paper, but it should be on top of this figure now. But, uh, just... Okay, thank you for the explanation. Uh, okay, thank you very much. So let's move uh, to the uh, next uh, talk. So uh, now we um, have opportunity to uh, hear the uh, results, which were measured with the uh, SLAC-12 uh, detector. Uh, class 12, you mean? Yes, Paul. Yeah, class 12, it, it's, it's not at Slack, it's at, at JLab. Uh, yeah. Okay. Could you share your screen? Yes. Yeah, thank you. So I will disturb you in uh, 12 minutes, okay? Oh, in 12 minutes, okay. But you have 15 for talk plus three for question. Okay. Please start. Okay. Uh, correlations between particles in deep inelastic scattering, or DIS, with large rapidity separation can be used to study the correlations that occur early on in a reaction. So the de deep inelastic scattering reaction occurs when an electron emits a virtual photon, which knocks a, uh, uh, knocks a quark out of a proton and that proton hadronizes to, to produce hadrons. In this case, what we're looking at is a high Z, uh, pi plus or pi minus, Z being the energy fraction contained by that proton. Uh, and then the other hadrons are also measured. Uh, here we investigate the correlations in the azimuthal separation, delta phi between the pairs of particles produced in the semi-inclusive DIS reactions in class 12 at JLab. Uh, numerous collider experiments have similarly been investigating delta phi correlations in E plus, E minus, EP, PP, PA, AA reactions. Uh, I have the references here. Uh, those include uh, Olive, Hera, and CMS. Um, and the large acceptance at class 12 makes it well suited for analogous studies, which probe extremely low multiplicities. Um, uh, eh. This is a uh, picture of the class 12 detector of schematic. Uh, the data was, was taken with this uh, using the forward detectors, using the drift chambers. Uh, which go from five to 45 degrees. We did not include the central detector because that is not ready yet for, uh, for the production. Um, the beam energy was 10.6 Jev and we used a liquid hydrogen target. Now, kinematics and definitions. We look at events with a scattered electron and a high Z pion and another hadron, which you consider the associated hadron. And the results that we, we present are in the uh, virtual photon proton uh, center of mass frame as a function of delta phi, uh, the difference in the azimuthal angle, no, that azimuthal angle and Delta Y, which is the difference in rapidity. Uh, and I give the formula for rapidity right here. And next slide. Uh, we use a pair acceptance correction using event mixing. Uh, so we're correcting for these pair acceptance effects in a data-driven manner. 
Uh, and this method was tested using an independent Monte Carlo based correction, which provides similar res results. So to do this event mixing correction, we take a trigger event, uh, we take the, the scattered electron and the trigger hat drawn, and then we take another event and we use the other hadron in that event and we combine these two and this gives us an unbiased sample uh, that, that we use as a denominator when, um, when dividing. So here's what I mean by this. You take the spectrum of the uh, same event yield uh, so delta phi on this axis and delta y on the other axis uh, and plot the number of events uh, per bin with a, a certain normalization scheme. And then you do the same thing for the mixed event sample and uh, you take the ratio of the two and you get what you call the correlation function. We do the same thing in the high pseudo rapidity region that I highlight in red. Uh, and we do the uh, delta phi projection on this. And we get a nice big peak at, at pi. Uh, the, for the mixed events, this high, the high rapidity difference region, we get uh, a small undulation. And this is similar to what we get from the alternative correction from the Monte Carlo. And for the correlation function, we also get the big peak at, uh, at delta phi equals pi, so back to back. And for this slide, I'm showing pion proton events. I do the same thing for the pion pion events, and it's a similar, similar picture. The data shown in both these two plots and throughout this are preliminary results. Um, so they are not final. Uh, we have done Fourier transformations on the correlation function, as I show right here, the formula. Uh, the data shown here can constrain target fracture functions. Here I show the V2 parameter of the Fourier transform. We see that there's not much dependence on Q square or X Bjorken but there is a much larger dependence on the transverse momenta of the two, two hadrons and on the Z of the two hadrons. Uh, the gray represents without doing the correction using the Monte Carlo or nor using the, uh, the event mixing. Here for the preliminary, I'm using the Monte Carlo method for the corrections. Uh, and the color is just where you have, um, or we're using the corrections. So the corrections have a small effect. Uh, we also looked for a ridge. Some of the other experiments and some predictions uh, predict a secondary peak. We call it the ridge at delta phi equals zero, which pr would persist at large rapidity separation we saw in the previous talk about about a ridge um, and this Monte Carlo from Django from a Hera H1 pre preliminary uh, shows that there's uh, that there would that they had predicted there would be a ridge but in their data they did not see a ridge and uh, upper limits were being set both at Aleph and Hera for low track multiplicity events. Um, so we try to do the same thing with, with class 12. Look at what happens when we do two track events, three track, four track, five track, uh, and then six or more track events. Here I compare the data and the Monte Carlo um, results. Both of them show no ridge, um, either in the pion proton top row or in the pion pion row bottom row uh, so no ridge signal is observed within our uh, range in theta so when we compare this to the other experiments cms olive and hera we see that the cms uh, found 
ridges, but at very large track multiplicity. At class 12, we observe no ridge at low multiplicity. Uh, the other experiments uh, have placed upper limits on the yield of ridges at low to, mid low to medium uh, track multiplicities. So the next thing I we were looking at was what happens when we use a polarized probe. So if the electron has initial uh, positive longitudinal uh, polarization versus initially negative uh, po polarization. Um, and so what we see is when we take the difference in the same event yield with positive and negative helicity beam, divide that by the total uh, same event yield and divide by the uh, electron polarization, we see that, um, that there is some difference um, at uh, positive and negative uh, delta phi. Uh, plot this versus um, or for the full delta y range and for the high rapidity difference delta y range. And we see that there is a significant delta y dependence for both the um, pi on proton and pi on pi on case. And what this is looking at is the long range spin correlations between the struck quark and the proton remnant. So in conclusion, the azimuthal correlations in rapidity separated pi p and pi pi pairs are a useful tool to study structure and fracture phenomena. Class 12 is well suited for such analyses due to its large acceptance and a high luminosity. No ridge signal was observed with class 12, which complements the collider experiments. And we see significant long range spin correlation uh, in both um, pi on proton and pi on pi on channels. Okay, I understand it's all, yes? Yeah, yeah, that's it, Thank yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So now it's time for the questions. I see no hands. Oh, I see Ronan. Please. Roran, can you ask a question? We cannot hear you. Ronan, we cannot hear you. Oh, he, uh, I see he has uh, uh, that he, right. he has tried to write in the chat. Does it work now? Yeah, it works now, yes. Uh, it works now, sorry about that. My, I just unplugged my microphone and put it back in and magically it works. Um, so I had a question on page six and seven. Um, okay. So the background distribution to first order is more or less flat in phi. The small wiggle that there is seems to go in a different direction from pi proton compared to pi pi, and and why why is that? What's the source of it? Um, we uh, we haven't quite uh, figured that that out yet. Uh, why why there's a, why it goes in a different direction for one case than the other. Uh, however, we do see that, that uh, when we look, when we try to calculate the efficiency correction from the Monte Carlo, it agrees both with the event mixing and uh, method uh, that's purely data driven and the um, Monte Carlo method, which um, is purely simulation. So, um. I'm not sure. So those plots there are for those plots there are for simulation, are they? I do, um, the, the green is is from simulation. What I did was I took the ratio of the number of accepted events uh, or, um, to those that were generated within the angular range. 
So I required that the generated uh, particle, um, I required that the electron and the trigger hadron be reconstructed and that, and um, I took the ratio of among those um, where the, um, or the secondary hadron was um, reconstructed to the total number of secondary hadrons with, within the angular range that was acceptable. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I would like to ask uh, about some results. It was slide, num uh, slide number uh, 12, probably. Okay, wait, tw 12? No, next one. Okay, 13, yeah. Okay. So I'm a little surprised uh, why uh, the contribution for full rapidity range is smaller than the rapidity for 1.5 to 2.5. Uh, why is it that there's a why, why is it that there are, that there is a larger um, that this is larger than this? Um, yeah, exactly. I'm I do not know uh, what 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 causes that as far as the uh, as the internal mechanics of of the it go. Uh, we also see that that the opposite trend happens for the pion pion. Case mm -hmm. then with a pion uh, proton case. Okay. Uh, we, so. But I, I I could also note that uh, that the uh, sine of two delta phi uh, term uh, diminishes when you go to the um, uh, go to the larger uh, rapidity range. Uh, yeah, we have we haven't uh, looked into what the cause of this is. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you thank again you. for a good talk. Good job. Congratulations. So uh, now we have uh, the possibility to hear the results uh, uh, for the uh, Hera. Uh, Stefan, are you here? Uh, uh, yes, I am, but actually it's uh, Juan who is going to present this. Stefan Schmidt, could you, uh, could you share your slide? Uh, excuse me, uh, Juan is going to present this, it's not Stefan me. Stefan Schmidt, I suppose it's you. Um, you cannot hear no, me? No, the, the primary, uh, sorry, the primary author is Stefan, but the speaker Juan Sun. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. I will be the speaker. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I suppose that you work together. Could so you share I... your screen, please? Okay. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Okay, please uh, make the full screen. Okay. 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 Perfect. You have uh, fifteen minutes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so firstly, thanks to the organizer to give us this opportunity to present. And my topic is probing quantum entanglement and collectivity effects in EP clearance at HERA. This topic is on behalf of H1 collaboration and I'm transferring from Shandong University. So let me begin with the H1 detector or H1 experiment at HERA. And the Hero Collider was operated from 1992 to 2007 with a symmetric detectors with electrons or positrons colliding with protons with the energies listed here. It, is a central mass, it, it, it has a central mass system boosted to the proton directions and the detailed information about the H1 detector are listed here. There are two collider experiments on HERA 
H1 and Zeus, and due to their measurement and effort, um, they can mirror the nucleon structure, func structure functions and the parton distribution functions here, which can promote our understanding about the parton correlations, as well as the dynamical picture about partons inside the nucleons. But uh, in fact, our understanding about parton correlations is not well understood yet. And in order to explore parton correlations, here are two kinds of approaches used. The first one is using the predictions from quantum entanglement, and the second one is using the collectivity effect. The data set we used are listed here with the beam energies and integrated luminosities here. And before introducing our analysis techniques and results, I have to mention two important kinematic variables here during the deep inelastic scatterings, the Q square and X. The Q square is the momentum transfer square to describe the difference between the full momentum about the scattered and incoming electrons here. And the X is the momentum fraction row stroke park. And so firstly, let's we begin with the first approach, the predictions from quantum entanglement. And in DIS, with the definitions of the quantum entanglement, um, with the plots here, we can see how the photon emitted by the electrons exploring the inside structures about the proton here. The region A is the explored region, and the B region is the rest of the proton. And according to the definition about the quantum entanglement, if the region A and B are entangled, uh, they should have the same entropy values. And according to the papers here mentioned, the uh, um, parton liberation picture and the local parton hydrogen dualities, um, we can compare as gluons and as hadrons um, as because the initial state um, gluon entropy should be equal to the final state hydrogen entropy here. And the S gluon can be calculated from the gluon density from PDFs, and the S hadrons can be calculated from the hadron multiplicity distributions from the experiment. According to the theory predictions, these two values should be equal. And with these equations, and here is the new measured charge particle multiplicity distributions here in this part in these papers. We can see that the particle uh, the hydrogen multiplicity distributions are new measured in certain Q square and X region. In low multiplicity, we can see that the data point can be well described by the Monte Carlo simulations, but in the high multiplicity, the Monte Carlo cannot fully explain data. And if we back to our predictions, so according to this kind of hydrogen multiplicity distributions, the S hydrons can be calculated. And according to the PDFs, and the S gluon can be uh, calcul calculated at the same time. So this these values should be equal according to the predictions. But in fact, according to the analysis result here, the x-axis is a broken x and the y-axis is entropy values. We can see that the solid point here, which represents the s hadrons calculated from the left plot and the curves here represents s gluons calculated from the PDFs. And they are they can't agree with each other in this result, which means that the, perhaps the data can cannot support the prediction. But we consider a, another two effect into our account, and the first effect is that the hydrogen multiplicity n is not very large and it can't be dismissed in this. Uh, as hydrogen uh, calculations. And secondly, in the current fragmentation region um, with the small x, the partons that interact with the virtue photons are the sequax, but, but not the gluons. So we can get the new measurement here. Similarly, the x-axis is a broken x, and we can see that in, in this plot, the data point can be described by the PDFs from the sequark. It, it, it indicates that the entropy of sequark agree with the hydrogen entropy. 
So based on this, the predictions and it's a test for the predictions can be established and our uh, content about quantum entanglement is finished yet. And the next part is about the second approach, the collectivity effect. So uh, um, before introducing our result, I have to mention the collectivity in small system. We can see that three plots here from left to right, from lab lab, P lab, and PP clearance with a decreasing tendency on their system size with a high multiplicity selections here. We can see that there are similar structural reach as well as the sign rule collectivity behavior. As the lots of evidence about collectivity in high multiplicity PP and PLAP clearance, similar to the heavy ion situations. So let's we wonder uh, what about even smaller system and specifically what about the situations in EP clearance system? In our analysis, we consider the DAS and the photo production processes and using um, and use two particle and four particle relations as observables. So firstly, let we begin with the DAS part. One point I have to mention in the DAS part is the difference between lab frame and HCM frame. In the lab frame, it will induce an inhomogeneous PT space, but in the HCM frame, which in fact the gamma proton clearance, it will induce an uh, induce a homogeneous PT space with mm, with no effect on the PT space and and isotropies, which means that uh, the observables, just like we and dealt, we extract from the PT space, will be unaffected by this. So uh, we turn to search for collectivity with H1 data in the H HCM frame. This is our result, the two particle correlation one. We can see that with the H1 DS data, there's no then kind of near side long range reach in both low and high multiplicities. And as we observed, no obvious reach structure here. We turn to extract reach yield limit through the on and bootstrap procedure, which described in our backup, backup slides. And then we can see how the reach yield limit um, uh, change with the increasing multiplicity in the two specific dart eat region. Here we can see the rich yield limit will expand as the increasing multiplicity and as we set the limit for the rich yield, we can also see that there is more room for the existence rule reach. And at the same time, we can also instruct a forward coefficient weight and dirt. And the basic procedure is that we can get the long range 1D projections uh, to particle correlation functions on the dart phi directions here. And we can see that in the 1D projections from low and high multiplicity here, they have similar shapes in low and high multiplicities. And we can see also how different orders for for orders contribute to the overall uh, for contributions. And when n equals 2 and 3, we can extract the weight and dart and with 3 dart from here. And the results are listed here versus multiplicity. The weight to dart value drops in high multiplicity and has a decreasing tendency. The with 3 dart remains negative, which indicates that there's no collectivity. In the trend is similar to the Zeus results, which mentioned in this talk uh, in, a, in an early time. And if our result is compared with Monte Carlo simulations with rep gap and the jungle simulations here, we can see that the rep gap has better description on DS data than the jungle. The difference between rep gap and the jungle is interesting and perhaps the difference is due to the uh, uh, color dipole model descriptions in the jungle um, simulations. As the data can be described by the Monte Carlo, the rep gap without any collectivities, we can also say that there's small room for the collectivity. 
And the next part of result is about multiple particle correlations, which can better describe the final hydronic state uh, correlation. In this kind of correlation, the few particle correlation is better suppressed, and we also use the sub-event cumulants to provide more reliable results. And this is our result C24 versus multiplicity with three candle methods here, the standard two sub-event and three sub-event methods here. We can see that in the three candles the situations, there's no obvious negative C24 in DIS. And if our result compared with Monte Carlo simulations, similarly, the rep gap has better agreement with data. And the deep inelastic scaling processes is finished. And the next part for to search for collectivity is the photo production. The motivation for our to search uh, collectivity in photo production is that uh, there's uh, there's a lot of evidence real real collectivity in hydron like layers, just like here, the non-zero with two values observed in, in PP ultra peripheral cle cle clearance and as well as in the high multiplicity selections PP clearance, there's rich structure. And also the result for the production processes in EP clearance can be regarded as hydronic clearance. So what about the search for the collectivity in these processes and in photo productions in EP clearance? This is our result. Uh, uh, this is a two-particle correlation result in, in with photo production processes. We can see that in low and high multiplicities, there's no near side long range ridge with H1 photo production data. And similarly, we extract the ridge yield limit here. Uh, we set limit and the limit indicates small room for the existence row ridge. The magnitude row ridge yield limit is similar to the DS ones. And we can go also get the V2 dart and V3 dart versus multiplicity has similar behavior in photo production data as in DIS, as, as the decreasing tendency and the stay negative here. I'm sorry, three minutes left, okay? Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, the C24, similarly, there's no evidence for negative C24. Um, with photo production selections, as well as no sign of collectivity. So finally, get our summary. The first part is the text about the predictions based on quantum entanglement in DIS H1 EP clearance. The predictions from the escalons uh, disagree with the hydron entropy obtained from multiplicity measurements, but with two additional experiments considered into uh, taking into consideration uh, the s ones can be in equal ways in the s hydrons, And secondly, there's no collectivity observed in either DAS or photo production in H1 EP clearance. Firstly, there's no long range near side reach. And secondly, V2 dart and V3 dart in DAS can be described by rep gap without any collectivity. And third, uh, no negative C24 and C24 can also be described by rep gap without any collectivity. So there's also open question about other energy structure in high multiplicity EA clearance. So this question should be answered by the ESA effort. And so. Okay, thank you very much. I suppose that something is wrong with uh, my screen because I still see the slide number 11, uh, no, nine. Oh, okay, now I see summary. Uh, some question, comments? Ronan, do you want to say something? No, sorry, my, I never took my hand down. <laughs> Proxy, please. Uh, you, yes, yeah. Uh, you mentioned that you also um, did some monocolor simulation, and but I don't really see you show that result. I mean, are they give you the same result? Uh, like no, 
I guess there is no much, there is no uh, reach in monocolor, but quantitatively, how do they compare to your data, the monocolor? Uh, you mean the DIS or photo production? Yeah, both, yeah, DIS and photo production. Uh, in fact, the red and the blue point is the result from the Monte Carlo simulations. Do you, do you have an example to show? I, I, I missed that, yeah. Uh, so I think it's slice 17. Um, it was a little bit frozen. I, I guess that's why Xingyang didn't see it. Yeah, <laughs> okay, so. Question. <laughs> so slice 17, if you may, um, if not, then probably we, we just have to go back to the slides. Yeah, I can see yeah. it. I see, I see, I see. Okay, this one, this is not a, this is not a standard pithier uh, uh, monocolor, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, because we didn't see this slide, okay. Mm. So let's check more question. No, no. If not, so thank you very much. It was really very comprehensive talk. Thank you. And, and the next speaker is Ms. Van Kampen. And now we will, uh, we have opportunity to hear about the Drellian transfer spectra at the late C. Mess, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Nice to see you. Do you see my screen? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Uh, thank you for this introduction and thank you for uh, this opportunity to talk in this nice conference. So I will talk about uh, the comparison between the part on branching method and the analytic resummation approach uh, CSS. Um, first of all, these two approaches are within the context of TMD factorization. So I'll introduce why do we need TMDs. Um, so at the LHC, multiple soft global emissions, they um, enhance certain uh, terms in the perturbative series in uh, the strong coupling. So fixed order QCD calculations do not work to describe certain observables, such as the transverse momentum spectrum of the um, Z boson. So we need to have an approach beyond fixed order in the strong coupling. And there are already approaches like, for example, um, part on showers in part to shower Monte Carlo event generators like Sherpa Pythia Herbic. And these are capable of um, describing the, the low part of the transverse momentum spectrum quite accurately. And then there is um, the resummation approach um, where these large logarithmic terms in the perturbative series are resummed. And one can do this with transverse momentum dependent objects uh, with, with TMD factorization. And the two formalisms that I will talk about, that I compare, both implement a certain form of TMD factorization. So first of all, the, the CSS approach by Colin Super and Sturman, and then the, the part from branching method. So I will introduce these two formalisms. Um, the the Colin Super Sturman approach is developed in the 1980s and is a well-established formalism uh, widely used to calculate the differential cross-section for um, inclusive hadronic processes. So um, in a hadronic collision, one can then describe the when one produces a, a hard system that does not interact strongly and uh, anything else like jets. Um, so the differential cross-section by CSS is divided in two terms, in a resumed term and a finite term. And the resumed term is the part that describes the low transverse momentum and is the most interesting part in this context since I'm comparing two TMD approaches and the TMDs uh, come in in this part. So it is written here in impact parameter space and factorized in a hard part with a Born cross-section and a hard function and two hadronic objects, so the two TMDs. And then the Y term represents the finite terms. 
These two TMDs in CSS are then factorized according to the size of the transverse momentum. And these three objects are the parts on distribution functions, the coefficient functions, and the pseudo form factor. So the soft clone resummation in CSS happens by these coefficient functions and the pseudo form factor, which, um, so the pseudo exists of uh, two perturbative functions, A and B. Um, and also the coefficient functions are can be expressed in a perturbative series in the strong coupling. And then non-perturbative parts uh, I wrote down here as SNP, uh, which can be implemented differently by different approaches. Um, and then also the heart function can be expressed as a perturbative series in alpha S. So far CSS, then the part on branching method is a quite different uh, approach since it provides a evolution equation for transverse momentum dependent part on distribution functions. And this equation is derived from the d -clap evolution equations. So by, um, by separating re the resolvable and the non-resolvable region in the phase space by introducing this uh, resolution scale, we can treat resolvable emissions with the the real part of the DCLAP splitting functions, and we can treat non-resolvable emissions with the pseudo form factor. And here, this solution of the evolution equation um, is solvable in an iterative manner with the, with the Monte Carlo method. And with this, we have a very intuitive interpretation, namely that of a multiple branching approach. So, um, in each branching, one can keep track of the transverse momentum by using momentum conservation um, only since we are uh, evolving TMDs, we need to keep track of the transverse momentum, know how to calculate this transverse momentum, the emitted transverse momentum. And for this, we need uh, an ordering condition for the evolution scale. So we use the angular ordering such that uh, we take into account the QCD color coherence effect and the branchings are then ordered in their angle. Um, so you see that this angular ordering condition appears in several parts of the evolution equation in the resolution scale, in the scale in alpha S and also in how we calculate the transverse momentum. Uh, so at the end, when we do forward evolution, for example, the transverse momentum is a sum of the, the initial transverse momentum and all the emitted minus all the emitted transverse momenta. Um, then there is this first term on the right hand side, which presents an evolution without any resolvable branching because it's multiplied with a pseudo form factor. Um, and this A, this starting distribution can in principle be uh, any function, but in up to now we use a, um, a collinear starting distribution at scale mu zero with multiplied with a uh, Gaussian that represents the intrinsic transverse momentum. Uh, so part on branching is implemented in the Monte Carlo event generator cascade where one can associate the transverse momentum of hard partons that go, go into the hard process, one can associate the transverse momentum to the TMD. Uh, it is also possible in Cascade to uh, calculate exclusive observables and performing then a backward shower, I mean a backward evolution. So there is a TMD parton shower that follows the, the same structure as how we evolve a TMD uh, forward. So then I come to the to the comparison of these two approaches. Uh, first of all, I look at the analytical comparison. So what is the uh, accuracy of the resummation? For that, we look at the Sudakov of both approaches and the part of branching Sudakov we can rewrite using this angular ordering condition and the momentum sum rule such that we have the virtual splitting functions here. And then we can compare the perturbative functions order by order to see what is the logarithmic, the, the logarithmic accuracy. 
So at leading log and next to leading log, we see that uh, these, um, these coefficients agree between part on branching and CSS. At uh, next to next to leading log, we observe some discrepancies between these um, uh, coefficients. And first of all, in the single logarithmic part, this difference is due to the uh, dependence of the B function in CSS to the resummation scheme. So in CSS, the B function, the H function, and the C coefficients, they are um, connected by a, they can be mixed by a renormalization group transformation. And this is why in a certain scheme, we observe uh, this difference with the D coefficient that is used in parton branching. At the double logarithmic level, we observe the difference due to the, um, the fact that the A function of CSS is uh, the soft effective gluon coupling, so, sorry, soft gluon effective coupling, while the K that we use in parton branching is the cusp anomalous dimension. And these two are, are not the same, and this is clearly explained in the papers by Banfi and uh, Katani. So then we can look at numerical, um, uh, the numerical comparison of these two approaches. First of all, parton branching, with parton branching, we can calculate the Z boson PT spectrum um, by first generating hard events at uh, next to leading order with Mathcraft. Uh, MC at NLO, and we want to then match it to a TMD, so associate transverse momentum to the incoming partons, and for that we have to subtract uh, Herwig 6 terms from the matrix element, since Herwig 6, the parton shower of Herwig 6 uses a similar ordering condition as parton branching does, so when we then add the TMD, we obtain the blue curve, and if we compare it to Atlas data, um, we see that we have a very good description in the low transfers momentum. Then we can do the same uh, for CSS. So Resolve is a recent application that is uh, made to implement CSS. And it can do the resummation, so the resummation part of the cross-section up to next to next to leading logarithmic level, uh, though it has no matching to these finite y terms yet. So this is uh, the analog of the, the fixed order QCD calculation that is used in part on branching. Um, and here you see two results, the next to leading log and the next to next to leading logarithmic uh, prediction using resolve. And you also see at next to next to leading log that the description is quite nice. So then there are two more aspects I want to highlight in this comparison because yeah the um, you see that the scale variations here are a bit of hourglass shape and we wanted to see uh, why do we have this difference in uh, scale uncertainties and this is actually a comparison that's also being done by the LAT electric working group at the moment um, so with different different resummation approaches. So in CSS, the scale variations are um, estimated by varying three scales. Um, and I specifically highlight here the resummation uh, scale variation. Since there is no matching, this uh, is a bit, uh, maybe a bit confusing. So the, the large fluctuations, the large variations are now due to the variation of resummation scale, you can see are at the middle uh, PT region. So this makes the large fluctuations in the middle and the renormalization scale uh, makes that there are big fluctuations or uncertainties in the lowest bins. For part on branching, there are two scales that are varied, the matching scale to the next to leading order matrix element has not been varied yet, uh, but there are also TMD uncertainties in parton branching, which are quite small in this uh, region in the LHC around the Z boson mass, as you can see. And then um, 
A last point is, but not least, the non-perturbative physics, so how it is parametrized by the different approaches. So in CSS, I pointed out this SNP vector, and in Resolve, it is currently implemented with a, a, a Gaussian, so it's a Gaussian smearing vector, and this value of G can be varied and is commonly between 0 0.5 and 2.5. Um, and on the right, you can see what happens to the to the prediction when we vary this. In parton branching, this is uh, quite different. So uh, we have the starting distribution, which has a Gaussian for the intrinsic transverse momentum. And this intrinsic transverse momentum is quite small. It's only 350 MeV. Uh, this would uh, be a value of 0 0.03 um, if we compare it with the, the Gaussian smearing factor. Uh, this we can do because this starting distribution is subject to perturbative evolution. Um, and that is why we can describe effects in a few GV range already since we, um, we have only a very small width. Um, so to conclude, uh, first efforts have been made to compare the parton branching method with uh, CSS at both analytical and numerical level. And at analytical level, we observe that PB and CSS coincide up to next to leading log. And differences arise at next to next to leading log, and they are uh, tracked down to the resummation scheme dependence and effective soft gluon coupling. And at numerical level, we see that both approaches um, are consistent and describe the low PT region, and theoretical uncertainty bands are estimated using uh, a bit different approaches. Uh, the non-perturbative effects are compared, and we see that uh, in CSS, a Gaussian smearing can be used, and in uh, parton branching, we have the intrinsic AT that is subject to perturbative evolution. So I think these are interesting features that are, are potentially important for, for high precision Dravian phenomenology. So thank you. Thank you so much. Congratulations, impressive results, because I think that if you describe the uh, PT in the range of one order of magnitude is success. So uh, let's check the question. Zinkian, do you have still a question? No, no, no. That's a prop from my last. Uh, <laughs> okay. Last year, yeah. <laughs> but the Ronan has a question, please. Yes. Um, no, very, very impressive results. This has been a bit of an outstanding problem for quite a while to describe the, the PT spectrum um, at, at low PT. So that's very, very nice to see such progress. Um, how does it describe other variables that are used? For example, um, the, the angular distribution between the um the muons this five five star variable does it describe that well as well yeah actually yes i have a backup slide with the five star here so yes indeed this is also quite well uh, described in a large region yes okay because you're probing different things i guess with that um slightly different but if it's, if it's describing everything you're doing a really good job <laughs> yes. <laughs> but yes, it's indeed, it's good to. So. But what about the scale uncertainty on that as well? That that does that sh is that a similar effect to what you showed earlier? The fact that it's. I think so. Yes. Um, so we haven't checked um, exactly what, what happens here with the scale uncertainties, but definitely you see that those are the largest contributions. Um, compared to TMD uncertainties, right? Hmm. But we haven't checked uh, the Phi star with, uh, with, with Resolve or with uh, another implementation of CSS. So this, yeah, this is only the part on branching uh, result. Okay, okay. Thank you. 
Ronan, do you want to add something? Or everything is clear? No, 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 that's 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 lovely. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mess, thank you very much. And now it's time for the last, thank but you. of course not the least, uh, presentation. Uh, Jan Jan uh, will uh, show the results about nuclear modification of digit at electron ion collider. Could you share your slide? Okay. Hello. Hi, nice to see you. Nice to see you. So okay. go ahead. Okay, can you see my slide? Yeah, full screen, perfect. Okay. Uh, uh, good morning and good night, everyone. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to, uh, for me to give a talk at the DIS 2021 meeting. Uh, today, my topic is about nuclear modification of digest at electron ion collider. Uh, I'm Yuan Yuan Zhang from Central China Normal University. My collaborator is Xinian Wang from Berkeley Lab. Okay, so here is the content of my talk. I will start with the introduction of the uh, central quantity of our study, the jet transport coefficient, the Q hat in cold nuclei. Then I will show the single scattering digit and the double scattering digit cross section. After that, I will present some numerical calculation for the nuclear modification of digit in EA collisions. It's as a the angle rapidity gap and the nuclear size dependence. In the end, I will summarize my talk. Okay, so we know that the jet quenching phenomenon can not only happen in heavy ion collisions, but also in electron ion collisions. And the, the past and the, the Q hat as the quantity to quantify the jet quenching phenomenon is defined as the average PT transfer squared per unit length and the past study showed that the Q hat in hot QGP is two orders of magnitude larger than Q hat in cold nuclei. So we want to know the physics mechanism behind the Q hat in cold nuclei. And there are already some existing effort about Q hat in cold nuclei. Like Ru et al, they use the PT broadening of final state hadron to extract the Q hat. And uh, there are also study from Chang et al. They use the suppression of the leading hydrogen to extract the Q hat. These two studies are based on the high twist approach. And uh, we have generalized the, the high twist, uh, have extended the high twist, uh, high twist approach to the generalized one by relaxing the approximation that final quark and gluon transverse momentum much larger than the exchange, the gluon transverse momentum. So there's no k perp or the twist expansion. And uh, with the medium induced the radiation spectra we got, we find it contains the medium gluon TMD PDF or the TMD Q hat. And by the definition of Q hat, we know that these two quantities are prop proportional to each other. And uh, from here, we know that we can use the generalized high twist approach to probe the gluon TMD PDF or the TMD Q hat. And uh, uh, since we, in our approach, we deal with the hard splitting. So we naturally comes up with the idea of using digest to probe the gluon TMD PDF or the TMD Q hat. And uh, from this example diagram, you can see clearly that the second scattering will directly probe the gluon TMD PDF. And uh, in our study of the uh, radiated gluon spectra, we do, we do not include the initial transverse momentum. So in our digest study, we will include the vapor. Okay, and for, for digest in EA collisions, for the single scattering case, the, uh, the heart splitting ha happened after the photon uh, quark scattering and uh, the cross section can be written as here. The nuclear modification comes from the uh, PT broadening of the initial quark. So the multiple soft interaction uh, between the quark and the, and the nucleus caused the quark PT broadening. 
and those soft interactions can be iconalized as a gauge link. And one can embed this PT broadening in the effective nucleon quark TMDPDF. It is the Gaussian broadening and it weighs depend on Q hat. And this uh, idea is from uh, this PT broadening idea is from this paper. And for the double scattering case, the uh, the the hard splitting is uh, is induced by two scat two scattering. And under the two pattern correlation factorization, the quark gluon correlation function in the digit cross section can be factorized as the quark TMD PDF and a gluon TMD PDF. And for the longitudinal momentum fraction XG of the medium gluon, it is smaller than XB, but those gluons are harder than gauge link gluons. And the cross section for uh, double scattering that uh, induced the digest is, uh, can be written as here. And uh, one, can, one can find that the, it contains the initial quark TMD PDF. It, it contains the PT broadening. It will depend on the Q hat indirectly. And this cross section depends on the gluon TMD directly. So we can say that the TMD Q hat controls both the single and double scattering uh, nuclear modification. Okay, and the, for the double scattering uh, digit, it has different uh, it has different diagrams diagrams contribution. So here we show the central card diagrams, one example diagram for central card diagrams, and the, the right or left card diagrams. And uh, uh, for the contribution in the double scattering, we can divide them by how gluon is radiated, and we understand them from the central cut diagram. And for the quark LPM term, the quark is radiated from, uh, the gluon is radiated from the quark line, and there is LPM interference between the final state radiation of the photon quark scattering and the initial state radiation of the quark, uh, quark gluon scattering. And uh, this LPM interference is characterized by the uh, formation time of the radiated gluon. For the gluon LPM term, the radiated gluon is, comes from the gluon line. And there, similarly, there's also LPM interference. And uh, the characteristic formation time is for the intermediate gluon. And uh, for, for the non-LPM term, there is no LPM interference because the radiation happens after two scattering. So there's no interference between initial and the final state radiation. And uh, since the uh, medium gluon TMD PDF, the longitudinal momentum fraction XG is small and it enter into the small X region. So we need, we need to consider the gluon saturation effect. Here, we use a simple model to include include the saturation. So when the transverse momentum of the gluon is smaller than saturation scale, we let it has the value just at QS. And when the transverse momentum k perp is larger than QS, it is given by the TMD leap package. So with this TMD PDF, we can calculate the saturation scale self-consistently by this equation. And for given xb, and the Q square, one can get a value of QS as shown by the uh, 3D plot on the right. And the, the scale in the running alpha S and the gluon TMD PDF mu, we choose it to be k -perp. And uh, uh, with our simple saturation model, we can also calculate the uh, quark transport coefficient from the definition of the saturation scale and the, the relation between quark Q hat and the gluon Q hat, and we can calculate the uh, quark Q hat. For, the, for this kinematics, the value we, got, we get is similar to the value uh, fr from other method. Okay, so the, the quantity we um, use to quantify the nuclear modification in, in 
digest collision uh, in digest is the nuclear multiplication ratio. So the, the definition of the ratio is the cross section in E A and uh, over the A times cross section in E P. Since we do not distinguish the quark jet from gluon jet uh, in experiment, the cross section here is the sum of the cross section with quarks and gluon kinematics exchanged. And here we list the kinematics for our calculation. And before we, um, we calculate the nuclear modification ratio, we will take a look at the digit spectrum. So here we plot the uh, digit spectrum per, nucle per nucleon for the single scattering and single plus uh, double scattering and single plus double scattering and also for the EP. Uh, collision. And uh, you can see that the digest spectra from EP collision and the EA uh, collision, they peak, they both peak at the uh, uh, middle angle uh, of the digest at pi. And uh, one also uh, find the double scattering digest cross section as the blue line is small. And uh, in some region, it can be negative. It is uh, due to the non LPM term contribution. Okay, so the, the first uh, dependence of the nuclear multiplication ratio we look at is the azimuthal angle dependence. So the azimuthal angle is the angle between the final digit. And with the fixed trans digit transverse momentum, it is, also the, uh, it is also the function of the dependence of the uh, digit momentum in balance. So in this plot, we have two, we have double x, x axis. And here we show a full set of parameter for the different parameter result of the double scattering nuclear modification ratio. And in this plot, we see that the contribution from non-LPM term, the, uh, the red line, it is finite. And the relative contribution will increase when the Z increase. Z is the momentum, longitudinal momentum fraction for one of the digits. And the quark LPM term as the green line is negligible since it is suppressed by both color factor and LPM factor. And the blue line is the dominant one. It comes from the gluon LPM term. We also observe that the magnitude of the uh, double scattering nuclear modification ratio decrease with the increase of the l perv and l q perv. So the double scattering contribution is power suppressed by digit transverse momentum. And then we also plot the single scattering nuclear modification ratio and the total ratio. So we, from the digit spectrum, we know that the single scattering uh, dominates in the uh, digit cross section spectrum. So the nuclear modification ratio from single scattering also dominate in the total scattering. And uh, uh, when we, and since the, the single scattering is caused by PT broadening and the PT broadening depend on the saturation scale QS, when we increase the uh, saturation scale QS artificially, the peak in the uh, single scattering modification ratio will move and the contribution from the double scattering will uh, increase with the increase of Q saturation scale QS. And the second uh, dependence of the nuclear modification ratio is the rapidity gap dependence. And it is also the Z dependence. We, all, we also plot the double X, X axis here. And uh, since the single scattering modification Nuclear modification only comes from the quark P broadening. Uh, the modification ratio should be independent of the rapidity gap, as, as you can see from the black dashed line on the right, fi on the right figure. And the, the contribution from the double scattering, the dominated contribution is the gluon LPM term. And it has a LPM suppression factor with the characteristics uh, formation gluon formation time tau. So when, when the rapidity gap increase, the Z will decrease and the forma, forma, gluon formation time will decrease. So when the largest uh, distance between two scattering, two RA over formation time tau F is larger than two pi, 
the LPM suppression will disappear and you will have the increased incoherent contribution. And uh, uh, similarly, so when you have fixed the tau f and you increase the nuclear size Ra, you, you will also have the incoherent contribution, increase the incoherent contribution. And uh, the, the dependence on the nuclear size Ra is a nonlinear Ra dependence. Uh, it is given by the uh, propagation, uh, the, the propagation length of the uh, integration of the LPM factor. And for the non-LPM term contribution, it is linear in Ra, as you can, uh, as shown by the uh, the propagation length uh, integration. And for the single scattering nuclear modification ratio, it is also linear in Ra, as shown by the black dashed line on the right figure. So we can we can say that the non-linear Ra dependence comes from the LPM effect. Okay, now it brings me to my summary. So in our study, we use digit correlation in EA collisions to prove the gluon TMD PDF or the TMD Q hat. And uh, we show that the nuclear modification in single and uh, double scatterings will depend on the TMD gluon PDF or the TMD Q hat. And uh, by the numerical calculation, we, we can see the LPM effect and the gluon saturation will bring some unique features in the azimuthal angle, the rapidity gap, and the RA dependence of the nuclear modification ratio. Okay, uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. So let's check the question, comments. Okay. I see no raised hand, no comments. So I believe that you or one can use your predictions in the future, I mean, in the area of the electron ion collider. Congratulations, very good talk. Uh, so where um, is no question, I would like to uh, close this session. Thank you all for your presence. We had the pleasure of listening to very good talks. And uh, do the conveners have any en enhancement or not?